Thanks very much. Yes, as Stephen said, I've, I've just come back from doing five years as a senior civil servant. I was the chief scientific advisor to the Department of Energy and Climate Change, where I was one of the people with oversight of climate science and geoengineering and many other policy issues. Let me tell you where I'm intending to go in the next 20 minutes. Um, I want to take a critical look, a critical back of envelope look at climate change action scenarios such as the ones that the IPCC published in the fifth assessment report. I want to help ensure that the scale and difficulty of those scenarios is being communicated well. That difficulty of climate change action then provides an argument supporting the Royal Society's recommendations of 2009 for research into geoengineering, both carbon dioxide removal uh, research and solar radiation management research. Uh, to, to put it another way, here's, here's what this talk is, is going to do. You might remember when Ken Caldera gave his talk this morning, Ken showed us a fan chart of credible futures and he said in all of those futures that you may end up with states wanting to take action doing solar radiation management. And that fan chart of credible futures that Ken chose to show us was from the fourth assessment report, not from the fifth assessment report. And as a, a five second aside, Ken mentioned why he didn't use the fifth assessment uh, report fan chart. And my talk is going to go and look at uh, the scenarios that Ken chose to leave out because I, I think Ken's judgment was that those scenarios are actually so challenging to implement. They might be technically feasible, but they're, they're, it's stretching credibility uh, to include them as, as uh, possibilities in our, in our thinking. So I'm going to go and look at that because I, 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 I think if that's what Ken believes, I agree with him too. And that, obviously that's important as part of our uh, narrative for why we're here. Okay, so that's where I'm going, and I'll use back of envelope calculations, which I, I love. And if you've heard me talk before, you may have heard this one. I just want to give you an example of a back of envelope calculation, which says, well, let's take the European policy that biofuels are magnificent, and we should have more and more biofuels for transport. There's a target of 8% or 10% or something like that for all transport, 8% uh, of, of transport fuels to come from biofuels in Europe uh, by some date. And Presumably they're imagining increasing that fraction forever. So here's a calculation we can do. We can just say, well, imagine if you powered all the vehicles on a road from biofuels, and imagine if you grew those biofuels on the verge of the road, on the strip of grass alongside the edge of the road. How wide would the verge of the road need to be? Okay, so we can make a back of envelope calculation, just write down some numbers and get an answer. So we make up numbers like we say, Let's have one lane of cars. Let's say they're going at 60 miles per hour. Let's say they do 30 miles per gallon. That's per UK gallon. That's the average fuel efficiency of new cars in Europe at the moment. Let's imagine your biofuel uh, productivity is, well, you have to look that up on Wikipedia, 1,200 liters of biofuel per hectare per year. That's the productivity of oil feed rape, which is the leading biofuel in Europe at the moment. Um, and then you need a spacing between the cars. Um, let's say they're 80 meters apart. And now we've got enough numbers to get an answer. Uh, we don't need to know how long the road is because the longer the road, the longer the biofuel plantation is gonna be. Okay, what do we do? We take the first number and we divide it by the other three and we take care with units and you get a length. And the length is the width of the biofuel plantation and the answer is eight kilometers wide. And I love this sort of calculation because it makes you say, hmm, okay, maybe that European policy isn't quite a complete perfect transport policy, maybe just switching to biofuels isn't going to be a hunky-dory way of getting ourselves off oil. And I wrote a book full of back-of-envelope calculations like that one, uh, which is available free online, and that book was aimed at trying to help people have grown-up conversations about energy arithmetic and energy options. It's been translated by volunteers into lots of other languages, and while I worked at DEC, it was also translated into spreadsheet. So the UK government has published uh, several times a tool called the 2050 calculator for the UK, which is a completely open uh, energy and emissions model of the UK, including costs and air quality impacts uh, and 
it's intended to be very clear what you're doing when you move the levers up and down. It's got levers for lifestyle change, it's got levers for technology choices, it's got levers on the supply side, and the user can choose any mix and then see have you got a plan that adds up or not. So uh, I, I'm delighted to have been involved in making that tool, and it's been imitated by another 20 countries now, so there are now 20, 50 calculators that are equally open for China, for India, for Korea, for Japan. Uh, there's a long list of other countries that have got similar open source energy models. And very recently, the team in DEC that made the 2050 calculator for the UK also led a project to make the Global Calculator, which is another open source energy and emissions calculator for the whole world. And the good thing about doing the calculator for the whole world is you don't just get, does the energy add up and what are the emissions? You also can represent climate consequences and see how your choices about wind and lifestyle and diet and so forth actually cause impact in terms of climate change over uh, future decades and centuries. So I encourage you to use that tool. It's probably useful to many of you and engage with it and please help make it uh, better. Now, I said that climate change action is difficult. In my book, I discussed how to make plans for the UK that reduced fossil fuel use for the UK to near zero. Um, and I, I didn't recommend this particular plan, but this is an illustrative plan with lots of technologies in it uh, to show the scale of what might be required. Um, so this was a plan where there was a switch to electrification of heating and transport technologies, some efficiency savings, not enormous lifestyle change. Um, uh, not, again, I'm saying I, I don't recommend this plan. I think lifestyle change might be helpful. Uh, and it gets its uh, electrical energy and uh, non-electrical energy from a, a range of sources visualized on the map here. The nuclear power is a fourfold increase in nuclear over today's levels in the UK. Uh, the wind power would be 64 gigawatts of wind, which is a sixfold increase in wind over today's uh, levels uh, and twice as much wind as Germany has got. And you can see the wood and biofuel plantations visualized in green and, and yellow, contributing only this very small amount of energy uh, on the right, right hand side. So the aim of this book was to help uh, people understand the scale of action required and how, how difficult climate change action is. You can make similar maps for other countries. When you do it for a country like the USA, which has a lower population density, you don't get quite such a striking intrusion of the low carbon stuff into the landscape, but nevertheless, per person, the amount of stuff you need to build and the land area required for bioenergy or whatever uh, is still just the same as it would be in, in the UK. So here's a visualization of four different ways of getting yourself 42 kilowatt hours per day per person uh, of, of energy uh, for the USA with wind farms. Each of these 10 squares is the size of New Jersey. New Jersey is Wales, for, uh, if you are British. Uh, 49 green New Jerseys showing the land area required to get you 42 kilowatt hours per day per person of bioenergy. And uh, so the total of all those 42s is 442s, which is not as big as today's primary energy consumption in the USA. This uh, picture on the left shows the recent 2008 primary energy consumption of the USA, USA which you can see is 250 kilowatt hours per day per, per person. So uh, again, I'm not recommending this uh, mix here, um, but this is just illustrating some options and the, the scale of them. And if you want to personalize it, here's a way of personalizing these four options. If you were getting 42 kilowatt hours per day per person of energy on average from wind in the USA, that would mean one two megawatt turbine shared between every 300 people, which is, I think, doable, but, but uh, it's a long way from where we are today. If you wanted 42 kilowatt hours per day per person from nuclear in the USA, it's roughly one nuclear power station per million people, so seven nukes for Los Angeles, five nukes for Chicago, and so forth. If you wanted 42 kilowatt hours per day per person of uh, bioenergy, then that's 4,000 square meters, roughly, of bioenergy plantation. And if you want to do it with solar in deserts, then you'd need 30 of these mirrors per person and uh, one, one of these towers for every 400 people. So that's a personalized view of the scale of a uh, some, some decarbonization options for the USA. Let me now talk a, a little bit about climate science. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. You probably all know this, but just to check, 
I think this is the most important figure from the fifth assessment report from the IPCC. It shows how the size of climate change, summarized by a single number, of course climate change is high dimensional and complicated, but here's a summary number, namely global warming, the change in average surface temperature. It's a graph showing how climate change depends on cumulative emissions. And this is the most important message in my view. Uh, this little insect graph is showing the emissions rate, which could continue to rise under a business as usual, possibly a bit worse than business as usual trajectory in red, or humanity could do a U-turn and the emissions rate could drop to zero, as shown by the blue line. That's a technical possibility. Um, and it's only if the emissions rate drops uh, not to 50% uh, of today, but to zero, that you stop cumulative emissions from growing. And because climate change is roughly proportional to cumulative emissions, it's only if you reduce emissions to zero that you stop climate change getting worse. So that's a very important message. It's a real inconvenient truth. It would be wonderful if all we needed was a 50% uh, reduction. But it really is going to be a, a challenge uh, if you think of it in country terms and you say, which country can we look to as a model of what to do? Well, the answer is none of them, because all countries have positive emissions emissions on the, on the vertical axis, energy uses on the horizontal axis. Uh, as interim targets, you could say, well, let's have everyone uh, emit two tons per year per person, please, or less. That means could all countries politely get inside the red box? And then a few decades later, let's have everyone emitting one ton per year per person, which is shown by the orange box, um, which is currently occupied by the Democratic Republic of Congo and Bangladesh. Um, so there's no role model you can look to uh, to, get, uh, to, to take this sort of action. It, it is difficult. Another thing I wanted to say about climate science is uh, looking back at this uh, chart here. Some people say, oh, well, who cares? The red line's okay. It's only three degrees of warming. Three degrees of global warming, who cares? That's the difference between sort of morning and afternoon in, in Cambridge. It's not a big deal. Uh, so it's important to, to be clear what three degrees of global warming uh, means, what it's like, and compare it to, to uh, other uh, changes of three degrees. So here's a, a change of three degrees uh, globally. Uh, you can look back 20,000 years, and 20,000 years ago, the global temperature was three degrees lower than uh, today. And that's because we were in the middle of the last ice age. Global sea level was 100 meters lower uh, than today, and there was a mile or more of ice sitting on top of North America and, and Europe. So if you're ever in an argument with someone who says, oh, two degrees, three degrees, not a big deal, maybe show them this photograph of 20,000 years ago, which shows what, what the Earth looked like, and uh, advise them that maybe a three degrees warmer world will be as different uh, from today as uh, this photo is uh, from um, today. We've seen pictures like this before. This is um, a business as usual RCP 8.5 um, scenario showing global, the global average temperature increase, uh, but segregated by region, showing the polar warming and so forth. And my feeling is this doesn't really communicate in a visceral way to people that this is something we want to avoid. So I'm always interested in finding other ways to communicate um, uh, how different things the world might be. Uh, Ken showed us uh, results uh, from a, a science paper uh, discussing the probability that summers in 2080 will be hotter than the hottest summer ever. Um, I'd like to pull it back into our lifetimes. Many of us here will still be around in 2050. So what about in 2050? And let's make it more... Uh, regionally specific for those of us who are from Europe, you may remember the summer of 2003, which is the hottest summer ever recorded in Europe. And then we can ask the question, by 2050, uh, what's the probability that um, summer will be hotter than that hottest summer ever? Now, obviously, the answer depends on which computer model you use, and the computer models have different sensitivities. When I showed you that important graph with its linear slope, there was a pink sausage of uncertain sensitivity. And these answers are now from the Met Office model, which is one of the slightly more sensitive models in that pink sausage. And here are the projections for two possible future scenarios. First, I'll show you the dark blue, which is the U-turn, where we do what might be um, almost impossible. 
and reduce emission rates to zero by the end of the century. In that scenario, uh, the black line is the history of temperatures in the summer, in June, July, August, in this region in Europe. And this is the record-breaking hottest summer ever. And you look forward to 2050, and if we get ourselves on that dark blue line, then this model is projecting that roughly 50% of summers will be hotter than that hottest summer ever. In contrast, if we stay on the red trajectory, which we're doing a reasonably good job of at the moment, then this is what it looks like. So I've put the mouse at the same height as that record-breaking summer, and you can see not only will almost all summers in 2050 be hotter than the hottest summer ever, uh, but they'll be hotter than it by a really significant amount, most of, most of them. So maybe this is a, a way of communicating a, bit more, communicating a bit more viscerally to people to care about climate change. Okay, so climate change matters, cumulative emissions matter, that's uh, bad news. Um, and now let's look at the fifth assessment report. What, one of whose messages is, yes, we can take climate change action, the low carbon train is leaving the station, we all need to get aboard, come on guys. It is, it, and I worry that maybe when the fifth assessment report and its summary were being uh, published, perhaps there was a, a, a bit of over-optimism, a bit of wishful thinking, and a failure to communicate how extremely difficult it is to get on that low carbon train. So. Let's look uh, at just a couple of details of the scenarios in the fifth assessment report. So what, what sort of things did the synthesis report say? Well, it said, there are multiple mitigation pathways that are likely to limit warming to below two degrees. So it's not just possible, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, uh, however, implementing such reductions poses substantial technological, economic, social, and institutional challenges. Okay, so it's a little bit difficult. Well, let's drill into that. What I want to do now is just look at the bioenergy assumptions in those scenarios and the carbon burial assumptions, just to, to get a feel for how difficult uh, these things are. And it's, I, I found it quite hard reading the fifth assessment report to actually find the numbers and to find them communicated clearly. Typically, you just have some graphs and there isn't any emphasis to, to try and help people understand the, the sort of gravity and um, enormity of, um, of these scenarios. So here's a graph, figure 6.20, which shows how much bioenergy, and it also shows how much of the bioenergy will be going into carbon capture and storage in these scenarios. And the scenarios are, here are shown in gray, which is a baseline business as usual scenario, in orange, which is a sort of half-baked climate change action, doesn't, probably wouldn't get you uh, to the two degree limit, and the blue scenarios are the ones that have a chance, a 50-50 chance or so, of staying below two degrees. Um, so, what do we see here? Well, I've highlighted in red and green for the blue scenarios and orange, respectively, what's being assumed about the amount of so-called modern bioenergy that you have in the year 2100. So, if you want a scenario that gets you to 450 ppm, you need, what does this say? About... 275 exajoules per year. Okay, let's back of envelope that number and understand what it means. Or if you want the half-baked climate change action scenario, then you need 200 exajoules per year. And in the, these two points I've chosen here also happen to show 75% of all that bioenergy going into carbon capture and storage, or 60% respectively. Okay, so whether you go for genuine, complete climate change action and you sort of solve the problem, um, or you go for the half-baked uh, one. There's very large amounts of bioenergy being used here and lots of it going into CCS. How much? Well, what does 275 exajoules per year mean? Allow me to do some back-of-envelope calculations. First, let's express it per person. That is 23 kilowatt hours per day per person equally shared between 9 billion people. 23 kilowatt hours per day per person. Let's compare that with the map I showed you earlier, this map showed the area required in the UK to get five kilowatt hours per day per person from wood and two kilowatt hours per day per person from biofuels. That's a total of seven, um, and here we're talking 23. Okay, so that's a lot of bioenergy. Or if you want to visualize it in terms of areas, I'm going to assume half a watt per square meter as a typical productivity, and people could free, feel free to argue with that, but if we make that assumption, which is my favorite sort of central number for good bioenergy, you need 17 million square kilometers, which is two USAs 
two continental USAs, roughly 10% of the world's land surface area to deliver that much wood, uh, or whatever the biomass is. The authors of the scenarios that got into, the, uh, into AR5 would disagree with my assertion that bioenergy productivity might be half a watt per square meter. They say, oh no, it's going to get far, far better. Well, that's something that needs to be communicated. They need to communicate clearly. They're assuming a radical improvement in the efficiency of uh, productivity of modern bioenergy. Um, and even then, even if you do make it more efficient, you still will need to be shifting 17 billion tons per year of bioenergy. And I'll compare that with the oil industry in a moment. We'll see that's about four times the size of today's oil industry is what's being assume, assumed here. So here's a rhetorical question. Is there any possible inconsistency with this view of the potential important role of bioenergy with other things that the fifth assessment report said, in particular working group two, which looked at the impacts of climate change? So working group two said, we're expecting climate change to cause all sorts of problems in rural areas. There's going to be food issues and so forth. So my uh, feeling is that there is a potential inconsistency between using lots of the world for bioenergy, especially the, de the developing world is where, where most of this modern bioenergy is going to be magically be sourced, and that's the very area which is going to be disproportionately affected by climate change. Here's another criticism of the uh, AR5 scenarios. It, they, did sensitivity tests to their scenarios, and they said, let's rerun our models, assuming that you can't have something. So let's say no nuclear, let's say no carbon capture and storage, let's say limited bioenergy. Now, when they said limited bioenergy, what did that mean? Um, well, here's, the, here's what they meant by limited bioenergy. They said, we're going to allow a maximum of 100 exajoules per year of modern bioenergy, and we'll call that limited bioenergy. Now, compared with today, that is a 5.6-fold increase in modern bioenergy over today's levels. So, imagine if they'd done the same with nuclear, and they said, yeah, we're going to have a limited nuclear scenario in which nuclear is only six times as big as today. Everyone would have screamed blue murder, and they would have said, that's not a reasonable scenario. Yet, for bioenergy, they've gone ahead and assumed that bioenergy, modern bioenergy can increase six-fold. So it bothers me that they haven't really done a, a stress test, a sensitivity test, to what if you really couldn't do sustainable bioenergy in the way they're, they're assuming. Okay, thanks. So in summary, how much bioenergy are they assuming? Well, even their li limited bioenergy scenarios are assuming what I would call a massive use of modern bioenergy. Moreover, I'm sure their models are assuming that carbon is being magically accounted for correctly in, in all of these uh, calculations. So they're assuming a global carbon price, and they're assuming that farmers and uh, forestry managers will all respond to that carbon price in, in a way that shows that they're aware of the carbon in the landscape. And that itself is a very big assumption to make. And when I was at DEC, I was one of the authors on a report called Life Cycle Impacts of Biomass Electricity in 2020. Uh, which looked at the, it, the possible carbon footprint of our current practice of cutting down trees in North America, shipping them through the Panama Canal and across the Atlantic so that we can set the fire to them here in order to deliver so-called renewable energy to Europe to, to comply with the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, and what our work showed is that uh, current sustainability criteria don't actually ensure that this is low carbon at all. It is possible that it's low carbon, but it's also very possible that you are deforesting the landscape in average terms, so you're actually causing a carbon release from the landscape. The second thing I want to scrutinize is how much carbon burial do these scenarios assume, the scenarios that achieve successful cl climate change action. So again, it's quite difficult to find the numbers. Many of the graphs in the fifth assessment report just show net emissions, and they show net emissions uh, emission rates dropping to zero in these blue scenarios here. Um, and here's another scenario that allows itself to overshoot and then net emissions drop to zero and then net emissions become negative. If you're only showing net emissions, you're not communicating to people the size of the CO2 burial that you're assuming. Because if you've managed to get emissions rates to zero at some time, surely there are still some people burning fossil fuels in that scenario, 
which is positive emissions, and so to have net zero emissions, there must be uh, equally large negative emissions going on. So I find these graphs quite dissatisfying because they don't show, they don't segregate out the negative emissions uh, from the positive. Uh, we can zoom in and get a, a hint of how big these negative emissions must be. This is an energy only net emissions graph, and you can see that the energy sector net emissions are negative. And if that energy sector is still burning fossil fuels, which I think is credible, then obviously you have to have negative emissions at a scale bigger than this black thing, which is minus, what's that, minus sort of 4 billion tonnes per year of CO2. If you drill into the fifth assessment report, you can find uh, some numbers. And here's an indication of the scale of carbon burial that's being assumed in these scenarios. It's on the lines of, in 2100, by the end of the century, it's somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to 20 or maybe even 40 billion tonnes per year of, of CO2 being buried. So now let me picture this for you and compare it again with the oil industry. Here is a radical climate change action scenario that gets the emissions rate down to zero by the end of the century and might limit global warming to two degrees plus or minus quite a lot. Being realistic, that's not going to happen, but you might still hope that we, turn the, we do the U-turn a little bit later and then to keep things, to keep within the, the budget of cumulative emissions, we switch on net, net negative emissions to, uh, to compensate for this overshooting here. You have net negative emissions uh, for the final decades. This is when the aliens arrive in 2050 with their magic vacuum cleaner to allow us to do the negative emissions. So, it, it, making explicit uh, what might be going on, in red I'm showing what the positive emissions would continue to be. This is, uh, I'm just imagining that we managed to halve our use of fossil fuels compared with today. That actually means that the negative emissions rate that's required is the difference between this red line and this purple line, which is ballpark 20 billion tonnes of CO2 per year. As I said a moment ago, the scenarios we're assuming. Okay, now let's compare that with something. World oil production today is 4.2 billion tonnes per year. So, these successful climate change action scenarios, which I agree are technically deliverable, are assuming that by the end of the century, we're creating a carbon burial industry that's four or five times as big as today's oil extraction industry. And that would be a completely government-motivated industry. It wouldn't, have any, uh, it wouldn't have any direct profit motive. It would only happen because of there being a carbon price. Whereas in contrast, the oil industry today uh, has grown up to the size that it's got because of the pro profit uh, motive and um, enterprise and, and so forth. So I do think it's stretching credibility to imagine that we are going to manage to create that enormous industry by, by the end of the century. I think policymakers should be trying to enable that industry to be created. There should be clarity about carbon prices and so forth so that uh, there is an incentive to, to try and create a, a negative em emissions uh, sector. So, to wrap up, what I've said may be a little bit uh, depressing. I could tell you all sorts of optimistic things as well about the prospects for reducing the costs of low carbon technologies, but why we're here is to talk about geoengineering. And I hope what I've said about the difficulty of climate change action uh, does provide a motivation for saying, yes, humanity may be interested in having some other options as well as just plain emissions uh, reduction. And I want to close by showing you a figure that uh, John Shepherd, who was the chair of this report from the Royal Society, and who was also the chair of my science advisory group when I was chief scientific advisor at DEC. Uh, this is a sketch that he showed me to just help people think about all the options that society has. Here's business as usual. The uh, axes are not labeled, but the uh, vertical axis is some measure of climate impact. It's sort of, uh, something along the lines of global warming, and time is unlabeled on the horizontal axis. Here's business as usual. <coughs> Society is going to do emissions reduction and reforestation to some degree. This is one of the levers we, we can use. And it's quite likely that if we only did that, we'd end up with very uncomfortable climate impacts. Society could also do carbon dioxide removal at very large scale, but that will be slow to, to implement. And if you finally get it going and start actually sucking CO2 out of the air in net terms, then you can undo the, the uh, level of global warming. And in the, that interim period, society might be interested in solar radiation management. Still, we may be in an uncomfortable world, 
We'll cope with that by adapting. I'm showing adap adaptation as a sort of quasi-reduction in effective temperature, if you like. And then what's left in this diagram is suffering. So these are society's options. Thank you very much for listening. Let's have just two quick questions here. Um, sorry, I keep interjecting. Um, I'm an engineer, and I'm obviously aware of all the problems with the uh, pollution and CO2, oh, sorry, CO2 emissions. And I decided to take it upon myself to turn my home into an off-grid home with um, 680 watt panels and batteries and a 250 watt uh, turbine. And I've actually helped people do 10 homes convert. So if one little engineer can actually do that, can't we all do something similar? I decided that I wasn't going to wait for government initiatives. The prices of, of panels was dropping rapidly because of, um, obviously, there's a huge interest around the world with uh, PV panels. So I decided to do it myself. And once again, somebody saw it and said, could you do that for me? Yep, I can do that. Good. So the, the question is, can we all... How do, would you feel? Can we all do it individually? So uh, let me uh, respond with a sort of yes, but... So in, in our uh, 2050 calculator, yes, you can crank up um, small-scale wind. So that's one of the levers you can crank up. And there's a, this has been developed in, in collaboration with many stakeholders, including Friends of the Earth. So it's all got a lot of stakeholder buy-in. And this particular lever small-scale wind doesn't have a massive impact. The reason it may have had a massive impact for you is I suspect you live in a low population density area, so you can have a reasonably large wind turbine, but lots... When the sun's not shining... Okay, oh, you've got a <laughs> when mic... The sun's, when the sun's not shining and the wind is blowing, and so this okay. 250 um, watt is a tiny, tiny thing. Okay, all right, it's a tiny wind turbine. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, but... I don't think that that's going to be a solution for most people because most people don't have enough wind. Solar panels, they work in the summer. They're, expen they, they're expensive, the costs are coming down. They work in the summer, they don't really work in the winter. And so if you want security, you have to have extremely large batteries to get you through, or you need a connection to a decent-sized wind turbine. And your home is not your whole footprint. Your home is probably only about 10% of your true energy footprint because you also have transport, you have stuff that you buy. I, I you depend on industry. Yeah. Uh, I can, I can and, run a heavy and, load during the and, day when the and, sun is shining, uh, so I can attach uh, my Listen car. to me. Yeah, listen to me. Your home is only a tiny fraction of your footprint. This is a delusion that a, a minister who I won't name had when he joined the Department of Energy and Climate Change. He gave a speech. He said, look at this wonderful wind farm we're about to build. It can power 5% of the homes in the country, so we only need 20 of these and we're done. He thought homes was the country. The home is only a tiny fraction of the energy consumption of the country. If you want to power a country, you need to power industry, transport, heating, all these other things, the, the, the provision of stuff for, for you. So, yes, you can do some stuff to power your own home, but it's, a, it's actually a delusion that cities could power themselves. Cities will have to depend on the countryside. You have to do big stuff. Yes, and we have big if, stuff in Greece. Uh, <laughs> and it sounds like your solar panels were big stuff. You needed many square metres of, of, I have of six solar panels. 180 watt yeah. panels. And, and, and I create uh, eight units a day, which I have having insulated my home. Eight and kilowatt hours per yeah, day. Yeah. Good. And the average British person today is using 125 kilowatt hours per day. I'm if aware you look at the entire how much uh, I use. footprint. I think so you have I, to go on yeah. to one more question up the back there. Is carbon capture and storage realistic? Uh, absolutely. It, it's not been done at scale in the UK, but every component of the chain has been done at scale. There are real power stations in the USA and Canada that are capturing CO2 at scale and burying it in the ground. They're doing it because that CO2 has a value for enhanced oil recovery. So it's absolutely doable. Yes, we'll need some more R&D to verify that the places we could put it in the North Sea are going to be satisfactory stores, and you need a carbon price signal to get it to happen. But I think it's probably going to be one of the most cost-effective ways of taking climate change action once we have a sensible carbon price across the, the whole economy. Okay. Uh, David, um, I, I think we all um, appreciate considerably the green and pink uh, 
columns that appear in the right-hand side margin of your book. And uh, I certainly would like to thank you for such a clear uh, exposition of yeah, yeah. the accounting uh, for the energy sources and sinks. Uh, but when you come to think about translating all of those options into reality globally, we begin to think of a massive computer program which optimizes all of these factors and all of the proportioning in those, in those columns in such a way that it commands the price and hence extinguishes the idea of the free market as a control system, Adam Smith's idea of uh, the invisible hand, and replaces it um, with a sort of massive global brain which controls the energy sources and sinks. Your thoughts? Okay, I think what you're describing is a possible policy approach to, uh, and I think there are many policy approaches. So the global calculator is not an optimizing model. It's a big model of the energy system that allows you to envisage anything that's technically deliverable, and it doesn't impose a, a particular policy approach or an economic optimization approach. So I think that's a helpful starting point for helping people understand options. I agree with you that if we had an economy-wide economy carbon price, and if, as David Keith has said, if people who bury CO2 are able to bid in to that and get credit for burying CO2, then you could have a nice self-stabilizing system where the price of carbon emissions will be the price of burying CO2, and that, that would, would be a very nice end point to get to. But I don't think that's the only policy that we need, because there'll be all sorts of sectors that wouldn't respond to that carbon price. So I think society will need regulation as well as an, eco an economy-wise carbon price. I think we'll have to have the questions in the, in, more questions in the coffee session. I'd like to thank you again.